a way to, you know, track and, and keep fraud from happening and, and allow whistleblowers to come forward. And so they did a restatement of what the intention of that original law was. They called this the Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act, which was a restatement of the original thing that it that the uh, the person coming forth, the whistleblower, just needed to show that they were um, – that they were a whistleblower, the first one, I'm still the only one, uh, um, about, you know, the issue I brought forth, and that uh, fraud was uh, committed. And, well, NIST helped me out there. They even wrote that um, they didn't do what, what uh, Congress asked them to do. But they, but uh, then the judges decided they were going to ignore that. They, they acknowledged that it applied to my case, but they were ignoring it so they can dismiss the case. But then you were appealed, didn't you, and you went higher up? Yeah, that, this was in the appeal level. Oh, okay. The lower Did case, it, it was just, was just you know, nonsense stuff. And, and I was the only one to appeal so that they couldn't be distracted by lumping it right. in with these other ones again. That's, that's why the other ones, the other two. Yeah, I think my connection up. dropped out when we're, I was talking about the Daniels, the first ruling. Okay. And then by the time my connection came back on, you'd moved on to uh, the, the later... And uh, yeah, so that that ruling, uh, then as you know, as Dr. Wood has gone on to say, was um, uh, you know then it was appealed, and uh, within that ruling, uh, there was a hearing for the for the appeal, wasn't there? Which was eight, uh, minute, eight minutes long. Eight minutes long. So there's not much you can say in that eight minutes. You're, you're pretty uh, much and that that, yourself. that was on the 26th of June, was it? Was it was it June 2009, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. Was it the 26th or the 21st? I can't 23rd remember. 23rd, maybe? 23rd or... Yeah. or Round about then. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was a physical, you know, face-to-face, -face, eight minute hearing, because you had some boards made up, didn't you, that you took into yeah. the court? Yeah, and then they... they but no, on. they wouldn't allow them. They wouldn't allow them. Oh, okay. Right, right. You had them made up with the intention of taking them in, though, didn't you? Right, and then it was one hour before our start time, they, they uh, said, you can't bring them in. Oh, really? It was it changed then, so I had it made up, and we're in in, uh, in Jerry's office, ready to go down there. And you know, when we came and said that, oh, we just it's, it's just hung up the phone talking with somebody. They said we can't, you know, can't do it. Wow, I don't remember uh, you telling me that. Yeah, so uh, we didn't get to have any uh, any evidence writing, but that was it. But but when um, we appealed the the first decision, we didn't. Uh, it was just my case that, that got appealed so that they couldn't get distracted by anything else. And still, at that eight-minute thing, the, um, the opposition was uh, trying to bring the airplanes back into it. In my case, I had yes. nothing to do with airplanes. She has no evidence that there were no – they were trying to argue Morgan's case in mind and, mix, and deliberately mix them in. And I think it was even in their write-up about it, too. Yes, so they did not want to discuss – that evidence that was in your case, I mean, that was a big no-no. And also, uh, on the defense side of it, the, um, they're, they're saying, well, you know, Dr. So-and-so, who has a Ph.D. in engineering, and then we have little Ms. Judy over here, <laughs> they're, they're playing that game. That, that's, that's pretty idiotic. So, so what, were, what were the evidence that you – what in your court case, what was it? You had uh, Morgan Reynolds doing the no planes. You had um – what, the Building 7, what was its name again? Yeah, this has nothing, my, yeah has nothing to do with yeah. my case. No. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how it came to be, uh, you know, put into place around the same time. Uh, I don't know how that happened, but to uh, Ed Haas, I'll type it in the, uh, in the, chat, in the chat window. H-A-A-S. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's so like time he surfaced. Yes, and he seems to have disappeared without a trace ever since. I've not heard much about, about him since. So he would have just muddy waters then, really? Because I've never heard of this guy's court case. Yeah, it was just, uh, you know, just <coughs> he's in, he's down. But... Okay, there's another court case I want to get to. Wait, 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 um, one second. What? But but the point being that uh, the judges acknowledge, this is respectful of me, they acknowledge they're ignoring the law, to dismiss the case. But do you yes. blame them? Do you blame them? Because it, nothing would have been accomplished if they, if the thing had gone forward if there's no supporters of the case. 
because if there's no spores of the case, uh, that means you just justify the judges and, and the case is gone. You know? yeah. <laughs> and justify no the. No uh, yeah. Right, right. It, it just it uh, if you if there's only five people who care about this case, it's it, you know it's controllable. But if um, if we had you know a hundred thousand uh, or even fifty thousand people out there or two thousand people out there in the street outside the courtroom. Yep. They're making a lot of noise uh, about this. They couldn't have swept it under the carpet. That, we'd have a different scenario. So, so, it was so your court case was that this, this contractors hadn't done their job that they've been paid to do. That way, that we are the the beef well, of they, your court. they also they also committed fraud. And it, it, an example I like to give is uh, like Underwriters Lab. They made two half scale floor spans you know, mock-up floor spans and two full-scale mock-up floor spans, and they, they cooked them, they set them on fire and uh, to see, you know, when they'd failed to support load, and they did, you know, they cooked them for twice as long at twice the temperature, Fahrenheit, and they didn't, fail, they couldn't get them to fail, so, you know, they had to call the test after several hours, and so, but then they signed off in a report saying that fire did it. That's fraud. When they could not get, any, you know, their floor spans to fail due to fire. Right. Absolutely, and they were. And, um, and they you can go down yeah. the list of. There's a whole uh, bunch of, of things like this where you know they knew better, and um, you know it, it was this this game that the court system had been playing. But the FERA Act was to was what Congress did to bring it back to the original intent of law. It's not a new law; it was the original intent of the law. They were restating the original intent so that um, they, they could have whistleblowers who could have accountability for the bailouts and every case that was still pending as of the date that was passed was covered and that was that included my case and uh, the the uh, the course you said they're going to ignore that and go back to being able to um, claim that you need to know you know prove premeditation where the person was standing and what their thoughts were and you know, whatever details and specifically this example that that I use is um, Let's say you have a, a contract for a, a, a mathematician to sharpen pencils for everybody. The, the best mathematician in the world, you know, is on the, the NIST report. This is a hypothetical. It's on the NIST report to sharpen pencils for everybody. That's what's in his contract, sharpen pencils. But then he sees that somebody has added uh, 2 plus 2 and got 9. Uh, but he, he isn't going to point that out that they have errors there because he's paid to sharpen pencils, even though he knows that this is a fraudulent report going forth. And and so the way the law was being interpreted before was that, well, if he didn't sharpen his pencils correctly, that's the only thing you can say was fraudulent, rather than he knows the report's fraudulent and he, he signed off on it. And so the original intent of the law was that if he knowingly allowed fraudulent or fraudulent report to go forward, it doesn't matter what his contract was for, he's committing fraud and that's, you know, that, that's fraud. And so to, to show, for example, Underwriters Lab signed off on a report saying fire did it, and they could not get fire to do it. So they knew fire didn't do it. It doesn't matter that their report, that, that their contract said they were just to sharpen pencils. And I think that was, uh, you know, a uh, kind of a cover that they were giving the contractors. Like, um, for example, uh, SAIC... Science Application International Corporation uh, on their contract. I think they're they're to have a typist typing in the um, equations into Microsoft Word. Well, they're what they're doing is preparing the report, and you know what their area of expertise is, psyops. <laughs> oh, but but they're just typists typing in equations on the report, as though that would protect them from being involved in. Uh, doing psyops you know they would knowingly be putting forth a fraudulent report but uh, right. you know the protection they were given is this loophole and FERA closed that loophole but the uh, the judges dismissed the case be pulling you know decided they wanted to use the loophole anyway so they had to ignore the law in order to use the loophole Okay, we're coming up to a break now, so um, we'll be back um, in a, a few minutes.